It is still considered one of the more deadly and dangerous substances, especially in its weaponized form. Now, scientists from the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego have found a substance that has the potential of generating new treatments for both anthrax and other diseases. Joining us to discuss the discovery and its implications is Dr. William Fenicle, a distinguished professor of oceanography and pharmaceutical science at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and the director of the Center for Marine Biotechnology and Biomedicine. Welcome, Dr. Fenicle. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Anthrax is one of those substances that has developed a certain mythology, especially after 9-11. Can you tell us what it actually is and why it's earned its reputation? Yeah, anthrax is a toxification, an infectious disease caused by the bacterium called Bacillus anthracis. It is typically not a very dangerous disease in that it's not transmitted from human to human, but the spores, when they are collected and distributed in an aerosol, in other words, mixed with air and blown around, they will be then taken into the lungs. And when this, the spores enter the human lungs, they represent a particularly dangerous form of anthrax, one that requires enormously prolonged treatment with antibiotics and one which is frequently fatal at the same time. And you'll remember after 9-11, there was a bioterrorist event in which the spores were transmitted through the U.S. postal system to a couple of our legislators in Washington. And several people were very negatively affected and there were several deaths as a result of that. So this is typically the danger about anthrax is typically that it forms a perfect bioterror weapon in that the spores can be produced and they can be distributed as an aerosol. Is the issue with treating anthrax, is it more about the efficacy of the medicines that we have or the speed of treatment necessary? It's about the difficulty in treating an infection of the lungs primarily. Anthrax is a disease that is contracted by farm workers. It fundamentally is in cattle and farm animals. And it is on occasion contracted by those who work on farms. But it is typically treatable in that type of infection. Where it becomes difficult is in the ingestion of spores and the treatment, the antibiotic treatment, is a lot more difficult, a lot more protracted. Could, could The antibiotic treatment could last months and months and months. Uh, and it's dangerous. But really the issue is that uh, as a bioterrorist weapon, anthrax could be engineered to be completely resistant to every antibiotic. And this is a relatively simple thing to do. With an engineered resistant anthrax, one would need an antibiotic that was stored and was unavailable to others to be used in treatment. So our anthracomycin drug, we envisioned as something that could be held in reserve that would be effective in treating anthrax. It's quite a potent drug and would serve as a, a possible reduction in these bioterrorism threat areas. And so that explains why you looked for a substance near the ocean or in the ocean, because possibly the people who are designing these uh, biochemical weapons wouldn't think to look there to find the last line of defense. Well, that's right. I mean, they wouldn't have this antibiotic available to them. I mean, you can buy virtually every antibiotic, and it doesn't take a very effective scientist to use those to create a multiply drug-resistant form of bacillus anthracis. So the idea is, and I think the federal government would like to see some antibiotics be developed that would not be routinely prescribed for casual infections of anthrax, but could be held in reserve for those situations where there would be an enormous outbreak of drug-resistant anthrax. So the issue is actually twofold. One is finding something which is not in common use. The other issue is one which we're dealing with antibiotics all the time, which is the development of tolerance within patients, right? 
Yeah, that's right. Or or biofilms, you can call them biofilms. There there are lots of other challenges in antibiotic treatment. But the thing you should also know is that the last truly novel antibiotic, something that was not just a knockoff of some of the existing antibiotics, was discovered in 2003. Huh. So we've gone for 10 years without the development of any novel, chemically different, novel, structurally novel antibiotic. And if this trend continues, the current medical emergency that we're in, not just with anthrax, that would be a minor problem currently, but with methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA infections, these are reaching epidemic levels, and they are definitely a medical emergency. So we need to look for new antibiotics, and where we need to look is in the last great resource for natural materials to treat these diseases, and that's the ocean. And so what is it about this specific substance that you found in the ocean that drew your attention? What struck us in the early stages of examining these materials was the relatively high potency, the activity in what would be called sub-micromolar concentrations and the effectiveness of this compound. So we began to look at it. We found that it was very potent against MRSA and even about 100% increased potency against anthrax infections. Huh. The, the real excitement is that this is an antibiotic of a completely new composition. It's unrelated to any other antibiotic that is known, and it is therefore an entry into a potential long list of new drugs that would be made by derivatizing or synthesizing analogs of this particular structure. So the most important part is its potency, the effectiveness against MRSA and gram-positive infections, and the fact that it's a brand new structure type. And how did you actually test the substance so far? This was a collaborative program with Trius Therapeutics, a small biotech company here in San Diego. We worked with them for 18 months to locate, discover, and at least partly develop new antibiotics. And this was supported by the Department of Defense, the Threat Reduction Agency, which of course would be interested in new agents were effective against the anthrax and other infectious diseases. We basically worked with them. They did the biology. They tested the materials that we were discovering in a variety of different assays against a broader cross-section of bat bacterial infections and found this activity against MRSA, found the activity against anthrax, as well as activities against a variety of other infectious diseases as well. So it was truly a collaboration. We're chemists here. We explore the ocean. We're not biomedical scientists. We don't develop drugs, but we do discover them. And in collaboration with Trius Therapeutics, this particular drug surfaced as an interesting new lead. And so your target was always to go after something that could deal with the anthrax, as you said, the results were significant. Were there any side effects or any other issues that right now would concern you? There's always those kinds of issues, but they really don't surface until well into the developmental pathway. What we know about this drug is it has all of the best properties that we could ever find at this point. It is very potent. It has a defined mechanism by which it kills bacteria. It is active in an animal model, so-called in vivo model of MRSA infection. It cures mice that are infected with terminal concentrations of MRSA. It cures them at around one milligram per kilogram of the whole animal. And so these are the characteristics of an excellent lead. What happens now is, of course, a long process of asking the kinds of questions that you would like to ask. Is it toxic? Does it have really negative side effects? And so this is a discovery that needs to be developed, and that's a longer road. But what we have given the pharmaceutical industry by publishing this work is a brand new carbon skeleton, a new type of antibiotic, which we would now hope they would take into their own developmental process 
make a variety of derivatives, solve any negative side effect issues, and it, in fact then develop a drug based on the lead that we gave them. Well, the implications of something like that is obviously marvelous. One thing I do wonder is, is the substance one which is plentiful, or is it particularly rare? It certainly is rare in terms of the discovery. We've examined a lot of diverse microorganisms from the ocean to try and find new antibiotics, and we found quite a few. But this one really stood out. Now, is it rare? Yes. Of the 20,000 organisms we've examined, none produce this except for one. And this is a Streptomyces species that we found living in sand on the beach in Santa Barbara, California. Now, can we make it? You know, the beauty of working with a microbe that makes an antibiotic is that you can then cultivate these microbes in very large quantities. In fact, streptomycin, actinomycin, these drugs that are usable today for, for many purposes are still made by cultivation, by a process called fermentation. And the fermentation processes are done in very large volume, culturing enormous volumes of these antibiotic producing bacteria. And in those huge volumes, we literally make tens of kilograms of pure active antibiotic material. So because this is a microbe, it can be cultivated to make virtually any amount of material that you would need. So you don't actually have to go back to the source so much. It's not an issue of farming, just continued lab work. That's right. We have this microorganism in cryopreservation at low temperature preservation. If somebody would like to have samples of this, we'll give it to them and they can then produce the drug themselves. They can modify the drug. They can take it into that secondary development process that we in the university are, are ill-equipped to do. In a broader sense, you were speaking about this earlier, you said that this discovery basically tells us that we need to do more work in the oceans. Does it also tell us that we need to do a better job of protecting the oceans? Because I worry about how acidification might affect the loss of some of these resources. Yeah, I think you're, you're very wise to, to, to understand and to be concerned about ocean acidification, about ocean warming. There are a variety of impacts that we now are imposing on the ocean. And, you know, to be honest, we don't really know the impact of warming or acidification on the microbial inhabitants of the sea. But certainly, these kinds of negative impacts are going to reduce the biodiversity and the oceans. And this is already being observed. And so if we are to maintain what is effectively our last true resource for natural pharmaceutical product. We have to be concerned as much about the ocean as we are about the pollution of our backyards. And so far, this is gaining traction in a very poor way. But we, of course, are worried. We need to do these kinds of studies. We need to know how to, to really conserve our oceanic resources. And most of us here at Scripps are dedicated to that activity as well as to our basic science. I appreciate your interest in getting the word out and especially looking then at the issue of conservation of these resources in the ocean. We tend to be very short-sighted, you know, of what we're doing in our environments. And a lot of people form these strong doubts and make opinions that are not based on science, but what they would like the world to be perfect world that you can still drive your <laughs> major SUV and, you know, pump gasoline fumes and all that. The reality is somebody better get concerned soon. Yeah. One of the things I usually say, it's usually in an economic interview, is that America's greatest strength is its greatest weakness, which yeah. is that we are fantastic when it comes to crisis. And because of that, we ignore prevention very, very often. Well, we're in an antibiotic crisis right now. More people are dying of MRSA infections than from HIV AIDS. And so for us to overlook 
these new sources of antibiotics would be very short-sighted. If you want more information about that, you can go to the Infectious Disease Society of America, IDSA, or the Center for Disease Control, and they'll fill you in on just how important it is to have antibiotics for some of these things. Well, looking at our resources and a possible resource to combat anthrax, I'm Andrew Hiller for The Prism on The Voice of Russia. And I've been speaking with Dr. William Fenicle. He's a distinguished professor of oceanography and the director of the Center for Marine Biotechnology and Biomedicine. Thank you for the insight and for the work.